Welcome to Faculty Insight, brought to you by Harvard Extension School in partnership with Podcast. I'm Jenny Atia, and I'm here with a distinguished classicist, Gregory Naj. Gregory, you are the Francis Jones Professor of Classical Greek Literature and Professor of Comparative Literature at Harvard, as well as the director of Harvard's Center for Hellenic Studies in Washington, DC, and you also teach at Harvard Extension School. Do you have any time to reread your Homer these days? I do, and in fact, uh, I try to read some every day. It's, uh, it's something that's ever-changing. Uh, my old professor, John Finley, used to say that the whole world is divided into Iliad people and Odyssey people, but then he went on to say that um, you can change identities from day to day. And which one are you today? I think I'm Odysseus today. But in fact, we're here to discuss the Iliad. But that's fine. I can switch maybe even within the same day. I see. And Odysseus was the many... The many-sided in the sense that he was a shapeshifter. He could uh, change from one personality to the next and thus survive. Unlike Achilles, who's monolithic, who's uncompromising, Odysseus is ever the compromiser in order to survive. Poor Achilles. He was the son of a goddess and a mortal man. Not a fun position to be in. Especially when he is aware, and his mother makes him aware, that he is the son that Zeus never had. Zeus wanted to marry Thetis, the mother of Achilles, the mother-to-be of Achilles. The problem was that the whole divine apparatus was threatened by this, because the prophecy was a son that results from a marriage between Zeus and Thetis, who is a goddess in her own right, would be so powerful that he would overthrow Zeus. So that has to be stopped. And imagine what would have happened if Zeus and Thetis had married and had been the parents of, of Achilles. More than I would like to think. Exactly. Well, we've chosen today to focus on a particular passage in the Iliad in Book 22, which I find rather shocking. It starts just after the gods have decided who will live and who will die. We have Achilles, the superhero of the Achaeans, and we have Hector of Troy. And at this point in the story, we have Achilles chasing Hector round and around the city of Troy. Hector is too afraid to stop and fight. Greg, will you read the passage, starting with where Athena approaches Hector, disguised as his brother? Absolutely. We're just at the moment where Athena swings into action. And so the she is Athena. She left him there and overtook Lord Hector. But she seemed Deiphobus in form and resonant voice, appearing at his shoulder, saying swiftly, I, dear brother, how he runs, Achilles, harrying you around the town of Priam. Come, we'll stand and take him on. Great Hector in his shimmering helm replied, Deiphobus, you were the closest to me in the old days of all my brothers, sons of Hecabe and Priam. Now I can say I honor you still more because you dared this foray for my sake, seeing me run. The rest stay under cover. Again, the gray-eyed goddess spoke, Dear brother, how your father and gentle mother begged and begged me to remain. So did the soldiers round me, all undone by fear, but in my heart I ached for you. Now let us fight him, and fight hard. No holding back. We'll see if this Achilles conquers both to take our armor seaward, or if he can be brought down by your spear. That's really something, because Hector thinks it's his brother and himself fighting Achilles. In real life, it's Achilles and Athena, the goddess herself, fighting Hector. Um, Hector is doomed. We have this scenario where Athena tricks him into thinking that she is his brother. This is a rather dishonorable act of Athena's, wouldn't you say? Well, gods and goddesses are not like us. Uh, the way they work in the universe um, is sometimes unknown to us. It sometimes seems as if they're doing things that are unfair. But look at it another way. Um, Hector is still making free choices. He's making miscalculations. 
and it's simply that the goddess accentuates that. How are Hector and Achilles supposed to feel when they fight if they know that their death is preordained, is decided by the gods, not by themselves? Well, they both know that they're going to die, and in fact, it looks as if it's the will of the gods. But when you really look hard at these characters, they're already willing their death. And they know what they're doing, even if they're temporary delusions, which just makes the plot even more exciting and more seemingly unpredictable from one moment to the next. The Iliad took shape in the 8th century BC. Yes. So I suppose we all know the ending by now. We're not giving anything away to talk Absolutely. about it. <laughs> Absolutely. But Everybody Zeus decides knows. that it is Hector who will die. Yes, he does. And by the time it happens, Hector knows it too. It's a matter of timing. And it's interesting that Zeus, when he wills something, uh, wills it in such a way that the uh, poetry of the Iliad accepts it as the plot of the Iliad. So the will of Zeus is the plot. Hmm. If you understand the plot of the Iliad and the Odyssey, you're on your way to achieving a level of morality and an understanding of humanity that uh, is close to what we call humanism. Gregory Naj, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. You've been watching Faculty Insight, brought to you by Harvard Extension School in partnership with ThoughtCast. I'm Jenny Atia. Thanks for joining us.